Hey friends, this is Waylon, your uh, friendly local elephant in human form. I uh, am honored and really enjoy bringing on a bunch of wonderful, amazing guests for you, for us, for our world uh, to be of some benefit. Today we have Chandra Easton, who is the author of uh, a book about the Buddhist principle or notion or deity of Tara. And we're going to talk about that. Um, Buddhism is non-theistic, so we're going to get into what the heck is a deity in a non-theistic tradition and how is it relevant to you and me. And we're going to talk about feminism in Buddhism and meditation practice and whatever, whatever else arises. Um, so here she is. Hey! Hey! How don't you look nice? <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I just biked here and it's quite cold, so I'm still warming up. I'm a little bit warmer. I'm in Berkeley, California. So we have a sunny day today. It's been quite rainy and cold. Oh. A huge storm with giant waves on the coast, uh, but we are warmer. So do you have a copy of your book with you? I do. I do. I'm turning up my phone. Yes. yes. If you can, like, uh, kind of go up and down a little bit because it's sort of a small screen. So Chandra Yuskin, and we have Embodying Tara. Um, so what does the subtitle say? I'm not good at reading backward. Um, yeah. 21 manifestations to awaken your innate wisdom. Great. So you kind of answer, I don't know if you heard my preliminary question, but Only you know, you and I are both Dharma brats, actually. Do you, I just uh, saw that in the uh, intro. Oh, yeah. I think I remember that from the first time I met you a long time ago, like 20 years ago, you interviewed my ex and I. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Yoga, you seem familiar. Yeah. Yeah. I think we talked about that back then. Okay. I've forgotten about that. Where did you grow up in the Trunkpa world there in Boulder? Or are you yeah, here in Boulder. In Boulder. I haven't gone far in life, I like to say. <laughs> <laughs> and why leave? <laughs> well, I lived in Vermont at Karma Tolling, which you may know, yeah. and um, Boston, and I worked for uh, Shambhal Publications, which published your book there. Yeah. Um, but I was awful at it, so that didn't work out, so I had to start Elephant. Um, but enough about me. So tell me, tell us a little bit about, like, what you do for a living. Who are you? Oh, my God. Good question for 2024 that's what i've been asking myself yeah. like, okay what next <laughs> it's always a healthy question for buddhists and all human beings to ask themselves regularly who are we no doubt no doubt who are we who's asking yeah <laughs> yeah exactly look at that there you go um yeah wow um i'm nothing and everything but on a practical level i i write i teach dharma i teach meditation and i really made that my life's work because I got really passionate about it in my early 20s and I thought I don't want this to be a hobby you know and so that's when I went to Dharamsala and studied Tibetan language my mama my Tibetan lama said if you really want to go deep and understand the dharma study a root language so that you can understand the meaning behind the words mm -hmm. and so I did that I took that seriously and my of course my parents were like how are you going to make a living especially my dad who's <laughs> was more practical and not um not technically Buddhist, you know, he's more of a, I'd say, philosopher. He's open, but not like my mom, who was a Trungpa student too. Then oh. we took refuge with the Karmapa when I was a little girl. I don't remember what? doing that, but wow. he said I did. Probably just wanting to be like So her. we're throwing around a few terms that people don't know, but Dharma is just the teachings of Buddhism. Yes. And Karmapa is a wonderful Buddhist teacher who has passed away and he's got a reincarnation running around, but um, I also met him when I was a kid with the, you, you know, the, the black hat. Yeah, what do you call it? The black, crap, black hat ceremony. ceremony. Yeah, mm -hmm. I got to see a bunch of them and he was great with kids and just a delightful figure. And then um, Lama is the Buddhist teacher. And you're a, you're, are you a Lama now no. or a, what are you? I'm not a Lama. I am a Lopan, which simply Lopen. means teacher. Right. Yeah. But it's in Tibetan, so it sounds cooler than teacher. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it was a Tibetan lama who gave me the title, uh, Tokusanga Grumshi. Yeah, it's a title, but uh, I, it, it, it's a Charya in Sanskrit. Yeah, it does sound kind of fancy. I also like to just go by my normal name, you know. I, but I felt like, you know, when the title was offered, why not take it? You know, when you get it offered a seat at the patriarchal table as a woman, I thought, okay, I'll take it. I'll take yeah, it. Yeah, damn right. I think um, 
<laughs> yeah, like everything in life and in Buddhism, there's like two layers to everything. So you're working, you were talking about the practical world of like making a living and, yeah. but also like your life inspiration or vision wanting to be a benefit and teach and study the Dharma. But yeah, that's such a good point. And it brings us to your book a little bit, which is, yeah. you know, women um, and the feminine principle as Judith Zimmer Brown and others teach, and I'm sure yourself, um, is not that well represented in Buddhism, which is a little bit disappointing. Yeah. Yeah, it's so true. I think in part, that's not because of the original teachings or teachers right. necessarily. I mean, we could talk more about that, but it's the cultural context the Dharma was taking root in, whether it was India or Tibet or you know, Sri Lanka, Burma, Japan, China, you know, these are all during, you know, history, his story time. Yeah. Uh, very strongly dominated by patriarchal systems of hegemony and all of that. So, yeah, so women, you know, in principle, when you read Tantra, for example, it's so great because it's so refreshing. It seems so inclusive of women. Yeah. And, um, it's still very heteronormative, though. You know, it's interesting. Tantra seems so cool and transgressive in some ways, but it's still very heteronormative in the sense of masculine, feminine. And there's some areas where that could be um, nuanced. But, but even uh, in your book, you have a quote or Tara talking about Tara, like that the, I think she's talking actually, that the masculine and the feminine, yeah. they're empty of nature. And it actually is quite transgressive, the, the yeah. teachings in yeah. a great way that's so true that's so true but it kind of but then in practice it's not really emphasized day in and day out you know i mean right but yes it's true that even tata one of the origin stories of tata that i highlight in the book is that it said that once upon a time in a distant eon so in a world system before our world system, you know, like the Buddhists believe in the Big Bang kind of theory of expansion and contraction, expansion and contraction. So in a prior expansion period, uh, a woman lived named Princess uh, Wisdom Moon, mm. and she developed a heartfelt motivation to really benefit beings and practice Dharma and awaken for the benefit of beings. This is called Bodhicitta, the spirit of awakening or heart of awakening, aspiration to be a benefit in the world, to be of service. And she went, there was a Buddha at the time named the Drum Sound Buddha. And his, she went to his community and said, I would like to take refuge and take the Bodhisattva vow, which means you really step into a commitment of working for the benefit of others, uh, not just attaining liberation for yourself, but attaining liberation for all beings. That's the ideal of the Bodhisattva, one who aspires to do that. So she wanted to take that vow. And the story goes that the, the abbot of, or the monks and the abbots of the monastery said, oh, very good, very good. What a great altruistic motivation. But you should, you should um, pray to be reborn as a man first so that you can benefit even more beings in a man's body. And that's when she, you know, oh. laid down, boo, boo. Yeah, she said, hell no. And here's why she said, there's no man, no woman, no self, no other. Such dualistic concepts are, um, you know, beliefs of the deluded mind, or she said evil-minded people. Yeah. Well, people, people who are deluded believe in those kind of binaries. Right. And she said, for that reason, I vow to be reborn again and again as a woman and to attain liberation as a woman and benefit beings as a woman for the benefit of yeah. of others so yay yay and heart and and heart sutra style is not just diluted like there's form and emptiness yeah. but yeah. the fundamental point there is like there's no inherent goodness or badness in masculine or feminine right or any anywhere on the spectrum yeah and if, in any case in case anyone watching is like been annoyed by far-right conservatives like there's nothing woke about this it's just saying we're all inherently, we have bodhicitta or we have basic goodness or we have Buddha nature and we're, we have potential to wake up and be kind to ourselves and others yeah. and a benefit. Is that Yes, and that's not, right? not gendered. Yeah, that transcends gender and duality. It yeah, and it transcends it. ableism and it transcends race and it, yeah. like all of us have the potential, but in the real world, 
there is sexism. And so I yeah. think yes. that's what's so powerful about your book. And you mentioned a few others had written books vaguely in the same territory around the feminine and, and, yeah. and Dharma. Yeah. So how, I mean, Pema Chodron, who we all love, and, mm -hmm. you know, she had to travel all the way to Asia to become ordained. Like, how do we, as a nun, how do we kind of wake up, or has it already happened, which I assume is naive, within modern Buddhism? How do we wake it up to kind of true, you know, following the letter of the teaching that we're all inherently full of Buddha potential? Yeah, how do we do that? I mean, that's a, that's a huge perennial question. How do we do that? And but I feel like so you would have... How do we wake up to our Buddha nature, or how do we wake up to feminism and embracing the well, feminine? More feminism women. and trans rights and you know right. uh, anti-racism work and all yes. this because you know you're a powerful uh teacher who is a woman and you have a powerful teacher who is a woman in dharma and i feel like you probably live and, and think about this yeah i'm seeing some of the comments here somebody said be in love yeah in love with yourself in love swimming in the love ocean you know remembering that we are in love yeah we are having awareness, as Ramda says, such a beautiful meditation, that awareness, this Buddha nature, is like the sun and its rays are warmth of, of compassion and love that bring that kind of embrace and welcoming of all people, all animals, all sentient beings, no matter what their gender is, what their um, race is, where they're from, their class, all of that just falls away. And the Buddha was a... He went against the stream. He said that I go against the stream. I go against this belief of the caste system in India at the time and still today. Yeah, um, it was he, very he, powerful he, and very rare for very, his time. Yes, yes. So he was a very social. I, I say that you know he was a social justice guy. Yeah. He tra he said no, enough is enough. And that women eventually he came around. You know, it's kind of a little sticky this story about women and him embracing women in the monastic order, but he eventually did, and this, what I've learned from my teacher, Lama Sultra Alioni, who's a woman, Western woman, like Pema Chodron, went to Asia to become a Buddhist nun, ordained in the 60s, uh, by His Holiness the Karmapa, this teacher we were talking about at the beginning of the time. So um, what she says is that this is really the only instance where the Buddha changed his mind, at least unrecorded in terms of the sutras, the, the texts that record his teaching, is that his his attendant, Ananda, challenged him because the Buddha wasn't what? allowing women into the order because he was worried that it would be too distracting for the monks. So he definitely was, was catering to more of that patriarchal system. Right. But um, his, his mother or his stepmother came, uh, Mahamaya, came and asked for ordination. His wife, who he had left to become a, a seeker uh, free of, you know, attachments. He, left, he had left his wife and his son, Rahula. Um, uh, Mahaprajapati, his wife and his son, Rahula, he had left them to be a wandering ascetic and, and become liberated. So once he got liberated, they came and said, you know, they made amends. He, he welcomed them and they were in awe of him and so proud of him. <laughs> Wouldn't you be proud? Like, hey, you know, I'm not angry anymore. I was mad when you left, but I can see why. And so she actually um, said she requested ordination and he initially said no. And then Ananda challenged him, his primary attendant, Ananda challenged him and said, why are women lesser than men? Are women not able to attain liberation or have the potential of Buddhahood within them? And Buddha said, Buddha Shakyamuni said, no, they actually are. They totally are. But I'm just worried about the social structures that, it, that yeah. the Dharma might not flourish long if I let women into the order. So that's heartbreaking. That's like, God damn it. You well, know, it is. But, but it's so like Upaya because, you know, there are yeah. nuns and there are monks and if you have everyone kind of party together. It's tempting. There are issues, there can be, but you know, that's the practice. And then yeah. as we know there's been a, you know, historically abuse from older monks to younger monks, etc. in every tradition, Catholic, Buddhist, etc. So there are real concerns. I don't mind him being concerned, but then yeah. you have to go a step further and be like, how do we work, how do we work with this, you know, yeah. 
And he did. He changed his mind. He did. He let women into the order. He ordained many women during his lifetime. And there's a very strong um, yeah. nun tradition within many of the schools of right. Buddhism. Um, it could be stronger, you know, and there are important people who are working to elevate women more and more. There's always work to be done. But I don't know if that answers your initial question. No, that was yeah. wonderful. Okay. I think, so coming back to your book, like, you could have written about anything. And I read a little bit about why, you know, your teacher, uh, Lama Sultan Alioni, uh, encouraged you to write about uh, Tara. Um, so what the heck is Tara? Because yeah. we're not theistic. We're not into like gods and worshiping and all that. No. But at the same time, we're not atheistic and we're not against whatever. So how do we how is tara relevant to our lives and our meditation practice or or love like you and the commenter we're talking about or yeah. how is tara relevant in a in a practical way well tara is love and action but like in a practical way who is she okay so she is this in some stories this princess who became a buddha and now she is you know abiding in, in the Buddha field, emanating infinite love and compassion to all beings. We just have to open to her. Oh. So that is a little bit more deity-like. Um, or, but let's define deity, which I do in my book also, because that's what you're asking. Like, how is a non-theistic tradition like Buddhism praying to deities, gods? You know, la or yeah. you know, um, it's called lagi najor, which is deity yoga. Like najor is yoga. La is deity, like Lhasa means the land of the gods, right? That's the capital of Tibet. It's a very common term. But what what Tara is, is also, she's also known as the uh, Buddha, female Buddha of compassion, commonly known as green Tara. But what I lay out in my book is a lot of people don't know about these 21 manifestations of Tara, which we can go into in a, in a little while if you want. But in terms of like, okay, so what is she in, in this realm of deity? Well, deities in the Buddhist structure are not the same thing as our monotheistic understanding of God. It's not the same. You can think of gods. <laughs> is this happening? Gods as I don't know. Sometimes, um, sorry again. Okay, so sometimes gods are. I like to say these are gods with a little g, not God with the capital G. <laughs> you know, in the terms of not the creator God. Right. And so gods are understood in many different ways, but in terms of this practice, like deity yoga, like I talk about this practice of meditating on deities, they are said to be representations or manifestations, expressions of Buddha mind, our awakened nature. They are the, the it's like I said earlier, like our Buddha nature, our intrinsic goodness, our basic goodness is like the sun, if we think of that, like our, our heart at the heart center, we like the sun ever shining, like Rigpa, aware, pristine awareness is always shining. It's just veiled by the clouds of our delusion. We don't know it. So if that sun is ever shining, the rays, the, those sun rays are manifestations of um, more subtle dimensions of energies and bliss and sound and light. And that's called the realm of, of, the, of, of complete enjoyment realm, Sambhogakaya. In, in Sanskrit, this complete enjoyment realm, you can think of it as like the blissful next step into manifestation from the sun. It's like the sun rays. And that's said to be the domain of these deities. It's sort of like emanating from the ground are these appearances, are these expressions of enlightened awareness, whether it's compassion, peaceful, wrathful, semi-wrathful. I'd like to say fierce instead of wrathful, but, you know, dynamic energy. And so by turning towards that or purifying our perception to a certain degree where we can unify our awareness with that and understand it, it's like a pathway back home to the sun, the source of the light. And so we play, do this dance of deity yoga to warm up to the ultimate union. You know, the, it's like foreplay to the ultimate union of like a liberation. And so we do mantra visualization, we embody deities to feel what would it be like like fake it till you make it you know what would it be like to feel like i was tara or a buddha it could be avalokiteshvara the male buddha of compassion it could be uh, vajrapani a fierce dynamic 
um, blue black deity. He's in the little tanka behind me. You know, it could be anyone. Yeah, and so uh, in that expression, depending on your karmic connection, uh, yeah. what you're trying to cultivate, and that's a way for you to feel what would it be like, and then eventually to dissolve all of that structure and then rest, you know, all that framework of sadhana or spiritual practice, and rest in what's called the dissolution phase of completion phase and other you know vocabulary um, where you're totally complete as you are you you dissolve into radiant emptiness and you rest in your basic ground your true ground of, of rikpa so deity yoga is a way to find that it's very colorful <laughs> it's very dynamic and then you rest in quietude then it's nothing then it's open awareness so it's basically you know um my understanding and sort of repeating a lot of what you said but for for simplistic morons like myself um it's sort of like, like a visualization of this e fundamental energy like you were saying yeah. the fierce yeah. or the wrath or the bliss or the whatever and it's a way to because you depict it it's sort of like snow or ice or it's like a fundamental yes. principle and you're depicting it so that you can practice with it or or work with it right but it's yeah, that's not great. meant to get caught up in the depiction and be like oh zeus oh tara is not a real god hanging out on a cloud somewhere exactly thank, thank you for tying that in They're, they say from the very beginning do not fall into the trap of reifying the deity as something true out there outside of yourself yeah. understand the empty nature of you and the deity right they call the threefold emptiness of Emptiness of self, emptiness of other, and the emptiness of the relationship in between. They're all interconnected. It's not, I'm not truly existent in and of my own self. The deity is not truly existent in and of her own self. And so um, if we come to the practice like that, then we won't fall into that trap of reifying the deity. You're very good at explaining all this. So um, how, so why Tara? And what, when we practice with Tara, this principle or visualization of a deity kind of, what are we doing and what happens? <laughs> Great. Yeah, oh. so why Tara? Well, she's, she is the, maybe the most, if one of, one of the most um, beloved deities, uh, Buddhas uh, of the Tibetan people. I, sh I say in my book, she's like the mother Mary is to Catholic. Oh. She's mother Tara. And uh, she's beloved and she's powerful. When you, when you do, I hear stories all the time from people new to Dharma, Buddha Dharma, new or older. Just sometimes when they start to do her practice, things start happening that are unexplainable. And I think they should remain in the realm of unexplainable. So she, there's something palpable about her energy. I don't want to make any promises, yeah. but that's been my experience. You can, and you so, can make it up if you don't want to be too personal, but like what's an example of something happens that like shouldn't be able to happen or something like that? Like, like a, a coincidence. Well, I mean, often she'll come in dreams to me or others. I just had a student tell me that she was reading my book and reading about one of the fierce blue black Tadas. Mm -hmm. And that night she had a dream where Tata came to her and blessed her and filled her with bliss and then helped her like purified her, her, some of her pain and suffering that she had in her body and then took her on a journey and helped her help do that for the whole world. I mean, that's an amazing dream. That's a like gift. Christmas Carol. And yeah, yeah, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, so whether these are just archetypes of our own mind, the subconscious offering of imagery because she was just reading about her, or whether it was truly Tara out there coming into her and saying, here, darling, I'll take you, I'll help you out. <laughs> Stories like that. And even in my, I write, tell a story in my book, I was writing the ninth Tara chapter, ninth Tara, Tara is green Tara in this pantheon of the 21 Taras. The green Tara is like the most, well, like the most popular Tara. You see Tonkas of her, she's right. uh, beloved in Tibet, for example. And so um, she, uh, I was writing this chapter. I was having a bit of writer's block that week, that few weeks, especially as I was starting the chapter. And one morning I was doing my morning contemplations, my meditation, and I said, I prayed to Tara, you know, please help me swiftly move through this writer's block. You know, I have a deadline. But also, please help me move through this with the wind, because she's often likened to be swift like the wind. Mm. 
green, the color green is associated with the element of wind. Mm -hmm. So she's very much the wind Tara. She moves swiftly uh, and, and is often shown in profile because she's like, a, you know, the wind moving, ever moving. Green karma deities are often, that's a karma family of the northern dimension of the mandala, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the green deities are often associated with the wind and that swift energy. So I was in that chapter just starting and saying, okay, please, um, can we be swift here? Because I'm, I need it. I need some help. Thank you very much. I'll take what you can give me. Yeah. <laughs> just this heartfelt prayer. Simple. And then I'm, I'm typing away and it seems to be going okay. It's not so bad. I was able to complete the chapter. I might've been in the middle of the chapter, honestly. Like I, I don't write the chapters in a day. I was probably working for a couple of weeks on that chapter. Is that day that I was really wanting to complete it. And so I've, I was able to complete it in the afternoon. I pressed, literally pressed send because I was just sending each chapter off to my editor. She was helping me along the way. That's how I wrote the book. And I sent it off to my editor, dear Tasha uh, and uh, Shambhala. And she, and I sent it off. And right when I pressed send, a huge wind <laughs> burst through the trees and my windows rattled. Like wow. that doesn't happen very often here. And it was very immediate. So the minute I press send, boom. Wow. And that was the beginning of three or four days of intense windstorms. Thanks for listening. Hope you're getting a lot out of it. The full conversation is on our indie platform that supports and continues our work. Elephantjournal.com slash videos. You can subscribe, listen, watch, and participate there. And when you do so, you'll keep these mindful videos and podcasts going. Elephantjournal.com slash videos. May it be a benefit.